so I'm here just to tell jokes and then release you to alcohol. I had to pay extra to get the last speaking spot. And I'm pleased to be here, and I know I've got some friends in the audience, so it's good to see you. I'll just make a couple minutes of remarks. Drew said I should go as long as I want, but I'll try to make it short so I can get you to where you really want to be. And I just made some scribbled notes in my lab notebook that I thought I'd talk about with energy and water, which is sort of a classic thing for me to do. So the reason I want to talk about energy and water is because I think they're very important. Energy is important, water is important. And I'm not the only person who thinks it's important. There are a lot of people who equate water with life and energy with quality of life. And there's a famous Nobel Prize winner named uh, Rick Smalley, professor at Rice University, who unfortunately died about a decade ago. And in the last years of his life, after he's diagnosed with cancer, went around talking about the 10 grand challenges of society. And he put them in order in a list, starting with energy at the top, followed by water, then food, then others. And he put energy and water at the top because by his estimation, they were the most important resources. And he put them in sequence thinking that if you could solve one, you could solve the next in that sequence. So if we solve our energy problems, our water problems are solved. If we solve energy and water problems, we can solve our food problems. Then you get to things like poverty and war and terrorism and disease and the environment. But we can't solve democracy or other issues until we get the energy and water problem solved. So they're important. They mean a lot to us. And they're the reason why I wrote this book, which you might have seen coming in, Thirst for Power, Energy, Water, and Human Survival. So the things I'm going to talk about are covered in that book. And I was pleased to see some of you carrying it around. It's a real thrill to have worked on this book for like 11 years and finally see it published. So uh, if any student turns in a paper late from now on, I'll be a little more sympathetic. But I'll still take points off, so don't get it wrong. I know there are students in the room, so I said that for them. So energy is important. Water is important. They're also interconnected. That's the key. There are a variety of things that show up. We use energy for water. We use water for energy. We use something like 12% of our energy consumption in the nation for heating, treating, moving, chilling, pressurizing water. So water requires a lot of energy. We use about half our water withdrawals every day, the non-consumptive uses for things like growing biofuels, but also cooling power plants. So half our water is used in one form or another for energy. 12% or more than 10% of our energy is used for water. So they're interconnected. Now, there's some good news there. <clears throat> By using energy for water and you know, water for energy, we can improve the systems. Energy makes water better. We can clean it, for example. Water makes energy better because we can make our power plants more efficient. So we get benefits from this interconnection. And if we had infinite resources, we could have infinite of each other. If we had infinite water, we could have infinite energy because with infinite water, we could grow biofuels. We could grow our way out of our energy problem. And we could dam rivers and get all the hydroelectric power we need. And with infinite energy, we could desalt the oceans and dig deeper wells and move water thousands of miles. So with infinite, this cross-section becomes really useful but we don't have infinite resources, we have constraints. And so a water constraint becomes an energy constraint and vice versa, and that's the bad news, that their cross-cutting aspects of interdependence creates vulnerabilities. Let me give you an example from the power sector. So in the power sector, you have this need for water to be at a sweet spot. It's gotta be just right, Goldilocks water. Can't be too hot, too cold, too abundant, or too scarce. And we can give us some examples where water wasn't in that sweet spot, and it hurt the power sector. There's a case in 2003 where you had a heat wave in France, a killer heat wave. 35,000 people died across Europe. People are dying from the heat. The, the water is hot <clears throat> from this heat wave. The rivers are hot. And the demand for power is spiking because people need air conditioning because they're literally dying, especially the elderly. And so demand for power is spiking. But at the same time, because the rivers are hot from this heat wave, the rivers can't cool the nuclear power plants as effectively. So the nuclear power plants are derating. They're actually dialing back like 15%. At the same time, hydropower is dialing back. So they're getting less power out at the same time that they need the power. And so people are dying. So this is a problem where water was too hot. The, it was outside the sweet spot. You can also have water be too cold. Some of you remember in 2011, where we had a freeze in Texas and some water lines froze, tripping a couple coal plants offline. A couple gigawatts of coal trip offline from frozen water lines. At the same time, you had freeze-offs, where you have water coming out of the ground with oil and gas production, and the water that come out of the ground froze, clogging those oil and gas wells, so gas didn't come out. Well, the power goes out, turning off pumps that operate the gas lines, and so the gas pressures go low. They're already low because people are consuming gas to heat their homes. Then the power goes out some places, pumps turn off, we have less gas in the lines, and you have freeze-offs from the cold weather, you have even less gas. Another 50 to 60 natural gas power plants tried to turn on to back up those coal plants and couldn't because it was too cold, the water was too cold. So water could be too hot, it could be too cold. It can also be too abundant. We think of floods along the Missouri River almost turned off the Nebraska nuclear power plant, and water could be too scarce from a drought, where if you don't have the water, you can't cool your power plant. This happened in India, where you had a drought trigger problem indirectly, where because there wasn't enough water, the dams dialed back on their power. They couldn't generate as much as normal. The demand uh, is higher from irrigation, electric pumps being used by farmers to irrigate the fields. So demand is up, power is down, you get a blackout. So this is an example of the vulnerabilities where you need to have water in just this right sweet spot, this Goldilocks water for the power sector. If it's too hot, too cold, too abundant, too scarce, the power sector collapses. That's a constraint in one becoming a constraint in the other. So that's the problem of the interconnection. 
unfortunately, trends imply it's gonna get worse because of population growth, economic growth, policies where we are choosing more water intensive energy and more energy intensive water, things like biofuels or carbon capture systems that are very water intensive. You add all that up and it makes it worse. And this implies that whatever problems we have today might get exacerbated. If you wanna to look to the future, you might also say that we'll start fighting over water instead of over energy. And if you want verification of this, I say look to Hollywood because they never get it wrong. If you look at uh, the Mad Max movies, in 1981 it was Mad Max Road Warrior, they were fighting over oil. Well, in 2015 it was Mad Max Fury Road, they're fighting over water, right? So Hollywood has predicted for us where the next battle will be. And that's the trend. We already have problems, trends are gonna make it worse. All right, so energy is important, water is important. We use energy for water, we use water for energy. The good news is in there that we can get better efficiencies. The bad news is we have vulnerabilities. The other bad news is trends suggest it's gonna get worse. Thankfully, there are solutions. So there's some things we can think about that might make the system better. And some of them have catchy slogans that I wrote down here. You have things like more crop per drop, which is irrigation efficiency in agriculture. Megawatts instead of megawatts. These are conserved electrons uh, that people could use efficiency to avoid electricity consumption. Showers to flowers, where we use gray water from our tubs and showers to water our gardens and flower beds and that kind of thing. Toilet to tap, where you take the toilet water, treat it, and then reuse it and drink it. It comes out of the tap. And that's disgusting. We would never do that, except we already do it all the time because we're all downstream from somebody, right? We take the water from our toilets, put it in the Trinity River, and make Houston drink it, right? So that's what's already happening. <laughs> but because it went through nature, it feels okay to us. But it goes through a pipe system, and we clean it up, we're not as comfortable with that. So toilet to tap sounds gross, although it's something we're already doing in some form or another. There's also the idea of using reclaimed water, this effluent, treating it, and making snow out of it. So there's ski resorts who aren't getting the snow they used to because of climate change or whatever changing meteorological conditions we have. They're doing snow making with this reclaimed water from wastewater treatment plants. In Killington, Vermont, a very rich resort, talks about this. They use it for all their snow making. So they call that the place where the affluent go to meet the effluent. That's another phrase, <laughs> if you've ever heard that. Anyway, so there are solutions. Some have catchy slogans, some are kind of gross, but they all work. Uh, Singapore already treats their wastewater and drinks it. They already do it on the International Space Station. They can't ship water up very easily to space. It's very heavy and therefore expensive. So they treat the urine and the water from hand washing, the perspiration, they collect it, treat it, and use it again. And in fact, my PhD work, my final PhD experiment uh, in mechanical engineering was on that water recycling system for the space station. And I did that work at NASA Johnson Space Center. And we had this setup where astronauts and people who worked at NASA would come in and use the urinals and wash their hands and we would treat their water and then make it into drinking water right there on site. And uh, it was a lot of fun to kind of do that and see people participate in this process. Uh, there is a, is this being taped? I don't know if it is, oh great, okay, I was gonna talk about Penn from Penn and Teller came by and he used the urinal and I measured the ammonia from his uh, wastewater, which I thought was sort of fascinating. So uh, maybe we can delete that from the tape because he might sue me, uh, but it's a true story. So we'll talk about that more later. So we have these problems, we have these trends, we have solutions, and the question is, what do we do while we're waiting? Well, the two things we can do while we're waiting, one is I say, let's improve our education, let's make ourselves smarter, let's get STEM education to a higher level, let's improve energy and water literacy. And so one of the things I'm doing is taking this book and turning it into a curriculum called Resourcefulness on Energy Water, and I'm working with ITRON, who's in the room, to distribute this to K through 12 school children around the nation for now, but hopefully around the world. So if you want some copies of some new curriculum for your school, talk to ITRON or talk to me and we'll get that done. Improving education is an important step in solving this, especially while we're waiting for other solutions. And the, the next step I would say is while we're waiting is to think about conservation. Conservation is one of those solutions that works at every scale. It works at every time scale and it works at every spatial scale. It works in a space as small as a room with a thermostat and as large as a city with more efficient design. It works at every spatial scale. It works at every time scale. It works as quickly as this afternoon, and it works with systems we build that last 100 years. Conservation is one of the few solutions that works at every scale, and we can implement with our decisions, and we can implement with collective decisions as a society. So it offers a lot of value. Because energy and water are interrelated, we get these cross-cutting benefits. Saving energy saves water. Saving water saves energy. In fact, if your goal is to save energy, saving water might be the cheapest way to save that energy. If your goal is to save water, saving energy might be the fastest way to save that water. So we get these benefits from conservation. It's cheap, we can do it today, we can do it at every scale. And I'll close with this story about my daughter, Evelyn, who's now 16. Um, when she was seven, we used to brush our teeth together every night. She doesn't really talk to me anymore, so we don't do that, but we used to have this, uh, <laughs> If any of you have advice about 16-year-old daughters, I would love to talk to you. I think one of her friends is in the room, so I'll talk to you later, Kelsey. So uh, we'll figure that out. But we used to brush our teeth together every night. 
and it was our little father-daughter ritual. We get our toothbrush, we get it wet, we turn off the water, we put the toothpaste on, we brush our teeth, and then we put it back down, we turn the water on, and we rinse it again. We turn that water off while we're brushing our teeth because we brush our teeth for a minute or three minutes or whatever it is. We don't want to waste that water. That wastes several gallons. And by the way, you should turn the water off while you brush your teeth as well. And that doesn't really save that much water compared to not watering your lawn. So really, you should quit watering your lawn. But then also turn off the, the tap while you're brushing your teeth. Anyway, we brush our teeth, we turn off the water, we do it every night, it's this lovely ritual. And one night, I didn't turn the water off fast enough, and she got really frustrated. She turns the water off and kind of makes a fist and looks at me and says, turn off the water, Daddy, the scientists need time. And I thought that was really amazing. It's like, wow, who's this precocious girl? Like, who, whose kid are you kind of thing? But I think she nailed it. She got it. Conservation buys us time. Conservation is not the ultimate solution for everything. It's hard to light a light bulb with conservation, for example, but it sure does buy us time while we get other solutions. And that's the idea we've got to keep in mind, that resourcefulness, thinking about energy and water in a conservation-minded way will buy us the time we need to get better solutions in place. And I'll stop there. So there we go. All right, thank you very much. I have my own questions. I had a whole year to ask them to this guy. So who has questions from the audience that would like to go before I do? Or insults and corrections are fine too. So yeah. Those, yeah, any insults or corrections? Well, okay. let me ask my first question okay. then. So what I noticed was you were talking about your daughter at the very end. What are some of the hopes that you have about that generation and what are some of the biggest concerns? My guess is some of it is the rapid growth of the pace of innovation is encouraging and our ability yeah. to use those tools and equipment. I, I'm very encouraged. So there are a couple of things. A lot of people complain kids aren't the way they used to be and that kind of thing. Millennials. And, uh, millennials, yeah, that kind of stuff. But I'm very optimistic and very enthused by what I see with school, with school children, also with college students. So I have the blessing of being a professor at UT, so I get some of the best students in the world. And they're really remarkable, and they inspire all of us every day with what they do. And they're living out and practicing what they preach at, at a mindset yes. around resources that older generations don't. Yeah. So they're already there where they already think climate change is their Cold War, it's their multi-decade challenge, and they're going to solve it just like we solve the Cold War, they're going to solve climate change and resource management issues. So they've got it under control, and I feel really good about it. I think, yeah, they're pretty smart. Let's just buy them enough time so that we don't screw it up for them so they can solve it. They'll figure it out. You so have I'm, nuclear engineers, finance students, everything. an urban planner, yeah. everyone in your class. I love that about Yeah, it. so the class who teach energy technology policy as engineers, geoscience, business policy, regional planners, you name yeah. it. So that multidisciplinary approach is what's going to take because the problems aren't just an engineering problem or just a finance problem. They're everything. So bringing the people together to integrate the solutions the right way, that, that's the way we got to go. Yeah. And so I feel really encouraged by the quality of the students and the passion they bring to it. So I feel like that's yeah, actually going to be fine, but we need to make sure we leave them enough time. Like, let's not make it uh, yeah. irreversible where they can't fix it because we make such uh, stupid decisions. So that's the main yeah. thing we have to do. Okay, you talked about K through 12. Uh, my dad is a public school teacher, right. and so uh, he taught history. But one of the things I loved in Austin is that we really connect the arts and the sciences. We really see sort of systems in all of it, right? Yes. So tell me about your own take on the art. You know, you talk about water, energy, yeah. nexus. Tell me about the arts art. and science yeah, so nexus like arts, and how important that is to educating people around I love energy. Art, yeah, I love, I love arts. My best friends are artists. Yeah, Your wife's kind of an yeah, artist. Yeah, so my wife's an artist and yeah. architect. And so I'm surrounded by my sister's an art teacher. So oh, some wow. of you, if you went to Hill Elementary, might have taken art from my sister, although none of you are of that age, I think. Um, but uh, maybe you had kids who went there. So uh, art's very important to this. We talk about STEM education, and people are yeah. saying more and more it should be STEAM, STEAM with the A in there. The other thing you can say is earth without art is just eh, right? <laughs> Nice. You got to think about that one. It's like kind of, you, you, yeah. you get it? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. <laughs> so art is what gives us something worth um, living for. Uh, yeah. Winston Churchill during the war, World War II, was confronted with a lot of budget challenges fighting the war. Yeah. And people said, we need more money. We need more money for munitions. We need more money for men. We need more money for ships to get us over to fight the battle. Cut the money from the arts budget and music budget because we need it for the war. And Churchill refused. And the generals were very mad. They said, well, why won't you give us that money? We're not going to win. He goes, well, if I cut all the money for arts and music, what are we fighting for? And I think that really captures it, right? Without arts and music, why are we gonna have the quality of life we want? We, we gotta include that in our approach to the solutions, but also as a motivation for why we do what we do. What a great point. Do we have any more questions in the audience? I think we have. You're ready for drinks. One Senator. more, yeah, we are, yeah, I, I think we are ready for drinks. All right, guys. Well, right. Dr. Weber, thank, thank you, you so yeah, much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thirst for power, you have it with you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Now let's go enjoy a drink, everyone.